Hey, Steve Barsh from Dream Adventure speaking to you from Philadelphia today. So we're gonna to talk to him a little bit. This is a pet peeve of mine. We've been talking to a lot of startups. I talked to six startups yesterday, one so far today. And so many times they talk to us about their exit strategy and their series A and seed startups. And we just don't know why they're talking to us about exit strategy. So it's been bothering me for a while. So I thought I'd get it out there. It's a big issue that we see. Here's my contact info is right on the front screen. If you want to reach me, please follow Dream It on all of our different social channels. Uh, we have a lot of new content coming, not only in August, but this fall. We're going to go real heavy. So let's dive in. First, I just want to set the table and give you a little bit more of an idea of who we are, just for a moment, quickly, so I can give some context, right? So Dream It Ventures, at the end of the day, we're a venture fund. We're a venture fund and we're a growth program. We focus on three verticals, and the three verticals that we focus on are health tech, security tech and urban tech. So health tech is digital health medical devices. Secure tech is largely cybersecurity. It's also anti-fraud, physical security, all different types of security. And then urban tech is prop tech, real estate tech, construction tech. So that's what we focus on and largely very, very early stage. Companies come into us. We do a lot of intensive coaching over a 14-week program. They spend a lot of time with customers and customer sprints. We spend a lot of time where they go on a bi-coastal investor roadshow and investor sprints. And our job is to find the best of the best companies from around the world, bring them into Dreamit and make them better. Now, if you're interested in that, just go to dreamit.com slash apply. We're still talking to companies. Cycle kicks off in just a few weeks, but we're still talking to really interesting companies. If you're interested, reach out to us or you can just message us or DM us. If you like content like this, please check out our YouTube channel where we curate a lot of this information. We have Dream It Doses, all kinds of interesting things. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. And then if you have recommendations for future episodes of Dream It Live, please go to dreamit.com slash live and you can sign up to be email alerted when episodes are coming out. Please, we'd love to hear your suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, for guests you'd like us to interview. We have a lot of guests coming up this fall, founders that have successfully exited, and a number of different founders to hear their stories. So if you have suggestions of guests we'd like to know as well, feel free to put them in the comments section below. That's absolutely fine to do that as well. All right, so that's a little bit about Dream It, where we're coming from, you know how to reach me. So let me tell you more and let's dive in as to what we're talking about here. So we're working largely with seed and series A startups in those three verticals I talked about. So we talk with thousands of startups a year and about 40 to 50 companies or so go through Dream It programs twice a year in total what we're doing. So we're working with these early stage companies and a lot of times when they get into what are kind of managing partner or final round interviews, they're pitching us. And you know, they go through what's the problem? What's the solution? What's their total addressable market? Quick point, on total addressable market or TAM, about 50% of them get it wrong. Check out, we have a Dream It Dose on our YouTube channel. Go to our YouTube channel. We have a five minute Dream It Dose specifically on how to do TAM correctly. Most, almost most people do it incorrectly. So they're talking about their TAM. They're talking about the competition, another Dream It Dose issue that we have. Um, they're going through all of this and then they almost record scratch on us. Realize this is an early, early company. What's the record stretch? They bring up a slide or talk about it related to their financing and they start telling us about, well, now we want to tell you what our exit strategy is. And, and it's like, wait, are you kidding me? Your exit strategy? This is the off-ramp? You guys are, you know, I'd say most Dreamit companies are a year to two years old. Um, they've raised a half a million to a million dollars already. They're coming into Dreamit. They're really early stage. And you're talking to us about your exit strategy now? I mean, to me, as an investor and an entrepreneur, and I'm still an entrepreneur, you know, we run Dreamit in a very entrepreneurial fashion. Why are you talking about your exit strategy and why are you talking about it now? And not to cast blame, but I'm going to cast blame. And if you agree or disagree, put in the comments section below. I think a lot of it is angel investors. It seems most startups that come to us, I was talking to one um, that <laughs> was out in the Midwest, not today. I talked to one in the Midwest, if you're watching today. This was a week or two ago. And I said to them, I said, that's the fourth time in an hour you've talked to us about your exit strategy. Uh, why? Why are you so focused on your exit strategy? It's like, well, I've been pitching a lot of angels and every angel I meet with halfway through the conversation, they say, what's their exit strategy? To me, that's a rookie question, right? Startups take a long time to be successful. I personally don't want to hear about your exit strategy. Dream It doesn't want to hear about your exit strategy because if you're focused on your exit strategy, you're thinking about it now, you're focused on the wrong things. That's not something that should matter right now. So let me tell you a little bit more, and if you can't tell, we're kind of passionate about the industry, or the issue, excuse me, right? So if you think about this, are you some prognosticator, you're Zoltan, telling us the future, that you know in five to seven years 
Who's going to acquire you? And by the way, does that make the most sense for you? You know, are you asking angel investors maybe here, put a dime in the machine and I'm going to tell you uh, here is what my exit strategy is. First, to me, it's kind of laughable that you think you know what your exit strategy is this early. That's number one. And number two, you shouldn't be focused on it. I'm going to tell you what you're going to focus on differently and how to talk about it. But this is not something, and I don't think you're smart enough, I'm not smart enough to know. And maybe you're smarter than me, and that's easy, right? That's really easy. But that five to seven years from now, you'd know what's going on, that somebody's going to be, who, who might be acquiring you, and if that's even the right path. So I just think, don't try to be so smart, and I wouldn't talk about it, and I'll tell you what you should talk about. Again, if you're just joining us, please do me a favor in the comment section, list what city you're from. Um, as well, if you have questions, if you have comments about what we're talking about, if you agree or disagree, just put it in the comment section, and we're going to be uh, addressing that as we go through. Let me just pull in my notifications so I can kind of find out quickly. Just give me a minute. I'm just trying to find out if I look at the live stream, I can see who's coming in. So it just kind of disappeared. Um, and Charles is welcoming them in, and thank you. By the way, I just want to thank Charles is working uh, Dream It. We have an office in New York City in Union Square. Charles is up working uh, as part of the Dream It team and out in New York. Charles, thanks for your help today. Dustin, thanks for producing and directing today. Dream It and all of what we do is a huge team effort, particularly when we do these uh, productions. Anyway, so um, if you have questions, if you have comments, just put it in the comment stream. Let's keep going. Why, why do I, I'm just going to say this is my opinion, I think it's a pretty dream it help opinion as well across the board, why shouldn't you be thinking about your exit strategy? Well, let me tell you what an investor is thinking about and what I should be thinking, what I think you should be thinking about too. Investors are generally swinging for the fences. If you're looking for venture capital, it's not right for everybody. And by the way, we're going to have some great bootstrappers on in the fall. We're going to have Anthony uh, Bucci from Revzilla who bootstrapped Revzilla from nothing to a really huge exit. So maybe you're going to bootstrap your company, but no matter what, when you're talking to an venture investor, they're swinging for the fences. They're trying to figure out how this next great startup that's sitting in front of them is going to be a grand slam home run. Right? If they're swinging for the fences, they want you swinging for the fences as well. And if you're thinking about your exit strategy this early on, you're not swinging for the fences. You're, you're, you're like trying to do a little, you know, you're, you're bunting. Sorry, I couldn't even think of the word. You're bunting. You're trying to get a first base hit. Maybe that works in baseball sometimes, but this venture is not a baseball kind of game from that point of view. It's a swing for the fences. Go big or go home. And again, that exit strategy doesn't have that go big or go home kind of feeling to us. Let's keep going. I have about 10 more minutes in the content, and then we're going to open it up for all your questions around this topic or whatever you want to talk about in startups. I'm good to go. Here's what I want you talking about instead. I don't want to hear about your exit strategy. I want to hear about your vision. I want to hear about how's the world going to change? How are you going to succeed? In three to five years, what does the world look like? What is your vision for your company? How are you going to build something huge and demonstrable? So let's get into that. Like, What are the components of the vision, and what are we looking for? So to me, we have a lot of Dreamit companies, so let me just give you that setup again. So companies go through Dreamit. They, they're with us for about 14 weeks. They're, they're seeded companies. They're going for their Series A. They go on this investor sprint, and when we work with our Dreamit companies, it's really cool. We try to get them to focus on their vision a lot when they're on the investor sprint with us, this bi-coastal investor sprint. And we want them towards the end of the deck to come to this crescendo, because remember, when you're pitching a venture investor, you're telling a story, and in a lot of times, for startup, it's a fairy tale, once upon a time, right? So you're telling this story, and, and we want it to end with this great crescendo. What's that fairy tale story at the end? And towards the end of the deck, as you get towards your vision, we want you thinking about how do you say to an investor, you know what? This is just the beginning. This product, this market segment we're going into, this geography, this is just the beginning for us. Because we want to build a, a world dominating, a market dominating company, if that's what you want to do as a founder. Again, that's what venture is looking for. That might not be what you're looking for as a founder. You're not looking to build a, a world dominating company. It's like, look, if we have three locations and we're doing a couple million dollars a year, I'd be happy. That's not venture territory, but if that's what you want to do, it's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, it kind of ends in that, hey, this is just the beginning. That's what that vision starts to look for, because here's how we're gonna, here's how we're gonna do it. Now, when you do that, just a couple things I want you to think about when you're doing that that are really, really important. You need to connect the dots. You could say, look, this is where we are now. We're in year two. And five, six, seven years from now, we want to own the entire marketplace. Okay, that's great. It's a little bit of a fairy tale. 
it would be great to kind of pepper in there. You don't need to have it on a slide. What are the one, two, three kind of inflection points, value inflection points along the way of how you're going to achieve that vision? Just give a little hint so people believe what you're saying is kind of credible. So first we're gonna do this, which lets us ladder up and do that, then we get here, and then we're gonna achieve our ultimate vision. We're going to dominate this market. Let's keep going. It's a great Peter Lynch line if you think about it. Right? I, I just love this line. In business, competition is never as healthy as total domination. Yeah, competition is great. This is about total domination. This is that grand slam home run. This is the kind of swing for the fences. An investor like Dreamit and other investors we work with, this is what they want to hear. Not, not choking up on the bat and talking about my exit strategy. I, I don't give a shit about your exit strategy. Some of the team at Dreamit will absolutely kind of think about how could it exit, what would it look for, but I don't want you, and, and we don't get myopic on it either. We have Dreamit companies like SeatGeek. What a great example. SeatGeek came into Dreamit in 2009. It came in as a company called Scribnia. They came in, realized they, we focused on their one or two critical assumptions. Halfway through Dreamit, they realized their critical assumptions were wrong. They shut it down, pivoted, and created a whole new company from scratch within Dreamit called SeatGeek. SeatGeek is a huge company and a massive success. And if they're watching today, love you guys. They're based out of New York. And if you buy your tickets from StubHub, you're making it wrong. Do it at SeatGeek. But anyway, total domination now is what a company like SeatGeek is going for. So what I want you to think about as you're going through this process, how are you going to dominate the categories you're in? How are you going to win? Because what an investor is looking for, again, that swing for the fences kind of mentality, how are you swinging for the fences as well? The last thing I want to say about that is in that idea of domination, think about in a way what an investor is looking for is how are you going to monopolize a market? You are going to be a monopoly. You are going to suck. You're going to be a vacuum and you're going to suck all the air out of the market. and It's all going to come to you. That's really interesting. Now we see some large, large tech companies today, the Amazons in the world and the Googles, where some people think they're getting too powerful. So, you know, as you get to be a very late stage company and publicly traded, it gets to a point where the world wants you to be doing the opposite. But right now it's about dominating and monopolizing, right? As you think about that, here's what I want you to think about. Then if somebody asks you what your exit strategy is, and we'll get to that, and that might be a question that comes up, I want you to think about this. If you're building a company that dominates a market, that is sucking the air out of the room, that is winning, you know what? The right exit opportunities are going to present themselves, and you're going to have choices at which exit you want to get off at, and when you're ready to get off, there will be multiple choices. And oh, by the way, maybe the choices you're going public. But I've been asked this as an entrepreneur, and people say, what's your exit strategy? And I'll say, you know what? I don't know what my exit strategy is. I'm, I'm one year in, I'm one year in to a five to probably seven year journey, and I'm not so smart. But I do know this, right? I do know this. If I can build a dominating company and I am profitable or maybe not profitable in today's landscape, but I'm dominating and I'm growing and I'm sucking the air out of the room, you know what? There'll be lots of opportunity. As in a team with my investors, with my management team, together we'll make that decision and see what makes the most sense. But I don't know what it is today. But I know if I'm winning, there'll be lots of opportunities. That's the important thing is to win and win big. So that's kind of what we're looking for. All right. So last point I want to make, then I'm going to open up to your questions. Again, if you're just joining us, please put in the comments section where you're joining us from, what city you're dialed in from. I'm going to just pull up those comments again. As well, if you have questions or comments in the stream, please put your questions in the comments. I'm happy to talk about this issue. I'm happy to talk about anything startups. If you're secure tech, urban tech, health tech, or any type of startup, happy to answer your questions. Just lay them into the comments section below. We're going to take them in just a minute. So if you're winning and sucking the air out of the room, the other reason that I want you to focus on this is there is a lot of investors, and we're one of them and I'm one of them, they talk about they want entrepreneurs that are missionaries, not mercenaries. And let me tell you why and what I mean by that. When you're a missionary entrepreneur, you're climbing this big mountain, you're climbing this hill, it's hard. You need a deeper internal passion, something that's burning in your stomach that says why you need to achieve this. Why have you picked this problem and why are you going to stick with it? Because when you're climbing up this mountain, you're passing 10,000 feet at high altitude. The journey is hard. You're out of breath. You can't sleep well. It's exhausting. And I'm not talking about climbing a mountain. I'm talking about building a world beating startup, right? It's a very exhausting process. And what we find kind of the joke is, you know, when the going get tough, the tough get going. 
if you're a missionary entrepreneur, you're going to stick with it because as, as you're on the ups and downs, like we've seen this, we've seen startups close a $3 million seed round and two days later, the CTO resigns. And then something great happens and something bad happens. It's a complete roller coaster. And if you're a missionary entrepreneur, you'll stay with it, not through the high highs. That's easy. It's the low lows, right? You know, they, they joke about there are no atheists in foxholes. It, it's when you're in the low low, it's the mission that keeps carrying you on. If you're a mercenary entrepreneur, you're focused on your exit, I want to exit within three years, when the going gets tough, we see mercenary entrepreneurs just kind of walk out the door. You know what? This is going to be harder than I thought to flip this and make a couple million bucks. I'm out of here. And a founding team dissolves. And, you know, at the end of the day, an investor is betting on the team, not the company, more the team, right? If you know the expression, you bet on the jockey, not the horse. And the reason why, just to go a little further, we find entrepreneurial teams all the time when they face adversity, again, they need that burning mission inside them. And again, when they, not again, but when they face that, the difficulty, we find if, a, if an entrepreneurial team is kind of walking down the street, hit a pothole and fall down, that great team gets back up. The crappy team that's kind of a, a B, B minus C level team can't back, get, get back up and get out of their way. So you bet on teams, you bet on mercenary, excuse me, missionaries to get it done. The last thing I want to comment, and again, if you disagree with me, put it in the comments section, let's take it on and let's discuss it, is a lot of times we see entrepreneurs make a little bit of a mistake, and, and that is, I want you to figure out the investors that you're partnering with, because it is a partnership, you're getting married to investors, are they missionaries or are they mercenaries? Is the investor you're working with, and again, sometimes we see this with angel investors, it's almost like if they're asking in moment one, again, there's a lot of great angel investors. We work with tons of great angel investors. We get a lot of angel investors refer companies to Dreamit saying, I've just written a check for a million dollars. Go to Dreamit and go get customers and go get more capital. There's lots of great angel investors. But whether angel, VC, whatever it is, is that investor aligned with you? Are they just mercenary in it for a buck? Or when the going gets tough, are they going to hang in with you and believe in the bigger mission? That's really, really important. Think about it from the investor that you're working with as well. Are they aligned with you? You know, that they're, at the end of the day, look, they have to generate a return for limited partners. But are they also aligned with the mission that they're believing that and taking that on? Last thing I want to bring up, epic fail that we see all the time. I will literally ask sometimes if the entrepreneur hasn't brought it up, we're excited about what they're doing. They're going through their deck. And I'll say, stop. Now, yeah, they're at the end of their deck. We give them about 15 minutes to go through their deck. Plenty of time to pitch a company. They'll go through about 15 minutes and I'll say, what's your vision? I mean, what does this look like in three to five years? If you're successful, what happens? And they'll say, well, my vision is to be acquired by you know, Medtronic or Cisco or Amazon. <laughs> and I'll say, well, I didn't ask you your exit strategy. I asked you your vision. And again, half the time, I ask for vision, and it's almost like train robots. I'll say, what's your vision? I'll say, well, my exit strategy is, but I didn't ask you your exit strategy, and you just did a face plant. Now, dream it, we can get over that. We can fix that. If it's a great company, companies come in to dream it, and only the really great companies come in, and they leave, and they get a thousand times better, we can fix that. But please don't face plant. If somebody asks you what your vision is, paint that picture and talk about how you're going to get there. Don't talk about your exit strategy. If they if you're, ask you for your exit strategy, I'm going to talk about that probably in a minute or two. Um, if they specifically say, what's your exit strategy? But for right now, if somebody asks you for a vision, if you hear Dream It say, what's your vision? You can even say, it'll tell us you watch this. I'm not going to tell you my exit strategy. I'm actually going to tell you my vision. All right, so we're going to open up for questions in just a minute. Again, if you're just joining us in the comment section, Please leave what your city you're dialed in from. And as well, if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section. We're going to take them live in just a minute. So again, what do we do? We do venture. We have this growth program. We focus on health tech, secure tech, urban tech. Love to find out. Um, if you're interested in us, we'd love to talk to you. If you want to apply, go to slash dream and apply, or you can just DM us if you want to reach out. We have a couple weeks left till the next cycle stick, uh, kicks off. We're still talking to companies in those three verticals. Please check out our YouTube channel. We have Dream It Dose there. We have this curated there. Lots of great content. Subscribe. We have a Dream It Dose coming out next week. I'm not going to tell you what the topic is on, but I will tell you 80% of startups make the mistake. So subscribe. You'll see when it comes out next week. Um, and then the last thing is if you like this type of content, please go to dreamit.com slash live. You can put in your email address there. We'll alert you when it comes on. Or by the way, you can just follow us on uh, LinkedIn and you'll get an alert. But as well, if you have a suggestion for future topics, guests you'd like to see us interview, all myself and the managing directors and different teams at Dreamit will be interviewing people. If you have topics you want to cover, people you want to see us interview and have on the show, go to dreamit.com slash live. 
If you want, you can leave it in the comment below. Either one, it's a little easier. If you go to slash live, we can take it there. All right, so we are gonna take some questions and I am gonna take a couple questions now. Just give me a minute to look down, see where our questions are, bring one thing up on my screen, hold on a moment, and I will start getting the questions. So here is the first question I wanna to get to. Let me just cursor up, make sure we're all on the same page, notifications, and we are live. So the first question is, all angels always seem to be asking, what's your exit strategy? Are you deciding, excuse me, are you suggesting I decline to answer? It's almost uh, like if you're a witness on a witness stand, you say, I don't want to answer that question. So here is my thought on that issue. If somebody says to you, what's your exit strategy? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying you should decline to answer. If you're a seed or a Series A company, I kind of think it's a, an inappropriate question to ask. It's not something you should be focused on. And I would, um, it, it's almost like public speaking training, by the way. And if you have questions, by the way, please leave them in the comment section. Love to take your questions. So here's the thought on that. So if somebody asks you that, I don't know if you know this trick in public speaking. If you're giving a talk anywhere on any topic, you want to have your three key messages you want to get across. You know, great key team, huge market, and here's how we're going to win. Here's our secret sauce. If somebody starts coming at you with questions like, well, what's your exit strategy? You can politely and divert that question and say, look, we're really not focused on our exit strategy right now. We think that's too, it's not something we can think about because most likely it's probably five or six years away from now. What we think is if we can build a dominating company and win, the right exit strategy will come along. So what we're focused on right now, all of our energy is dominating and winning. So right now we're not focused on our exit strategy. We're, we don't have one. That's what I would do. That's how I would answer it. Okay, let me take the next question. If you have a question, please put them in the comment section. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, so what are the elements of a great vision is the next question we have. So let me answer that. What are the elements of the great vision? So to me, the elements of a great vision is it needs to be big, right? Paul Graham from Y Combinator has a great line. What's your big, hairy, audacious goal? What's your BHAG? So what does that BHAG look like? What does that great vision look like? And think, you know, our vision is in three to five years. What are those measurable things? How can you say that we're dominating the industry? We're number one. We've expanded to these geographies. We're the brand leader. People think about um, a mobile device that measures echocardiogram or a device that stops um, an, an interesting area, by the way, to our secure tech team is deep fakes and fake news, especially deep fakes, is that the deep fake industry, we're almost like the Adobe Photoshop for deep fakes on the opposite side of the deep fakes issue or Adobe Premiere, but on the opposite side. We want to be the brand. That is our vision for what we're going to achieve. So it's big. It's expansive. It talks about how you're going to dominate. And the other element to me that's really interesting for really good vision is you just kind of lace it along the way with the two or three key points of milestones you need to get there to achieve that vision. You lace that in. But that's what that vision looks like. And sometimes people say that a great founder, a great CEO, when they talk about their vision, they've almost suspended disbelief. It's just so far out, but you connect the dots to get there. All right, so let me get to the next question. Oh, what are the elements of a great vision? We just did that, so I talked about that. Let me go to the next question. Should I have an exit strategy slide in the parking lot of my pitch deck? All right, should you have? So debatable. Here's what I'm going to say. Rip the Band-Aid off. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have it in there. I don't want you to have an exit strategy in there. Now, look, if you're an entrepreneur and you've pitched it so many times and you're like, look, okay, fine, I'll take your advice. I won't talk about my exit strategy, but I'm just not comfortable enough. I still want to have the training wheels on my deck. Fine, put the exit strategy in parking lot slide and then never use it. Never, I'm going to switch cameras, never use what that exit strategy is, okay? I don't want you focusing on it. I don't want you thinking about it. I don't want you talking to investors about what that exit strategy is. I wouldn't have that slide in there. You shouldn't need it for seed in Series A. Look, if you're a Series D company, Series E company, you're doing mezzanine debt, you're thinking you're going to IPO in two or three years, sure, absolutely, you could start talking about that and IPO might be the, the avenue. But I don't think this early on, you shouldn't even have it in the deck. Pull the crutch away, knock the training wheels off, get rid of it. That's my opinion. If you notice, I'm kind of opinionated in the issue. All right, let's go to the next question again. If you have questions, please bring them in. All right, should founders be talking to the corp dev teams before they even are looking for an exit? What's the right time to start? Look, so there's, there's two sides to that issue. Let me talk about it. So let's say there's a corporate partner. Um, we work with our health tech teams. A lot of them work uh, or meet with Philips, uh, Philips Healthcare in both the U.S. and Europe. 
So Philips, Philips has a corp dev team. They do a lot of biz dev deals. They do M&A and then Philips has Philips Ventures where they're doing venture deals. So whether you're talking to the corporate venture capital side or you're talking to the corp dev side, you can talk to them early because a lot of times we see that startups build the relationship with a corp dev team that eventually that's the team that often does M&A, mergers and acquisitions. It's called corporate development if you haven't heard that term before. So it's fine to talk to them early because maybe what you want to do is date before you get married. I mean, they need to get to know you, right? So you can say, look, is there a business deal that we could do? How could we partner? What could we do together? How do we get to know those teams? So sometimes you see people work with a corp dev team for two, three, four years, and it gets bigger and bitter, bigger, and then eventually an acquisition comes of it. So there's no problem talking to them early. Same thing with the corporate venture capital team. Maybe you're going to get investment. Now, I think we'll do a different Dream It episode, a Dream It Live on corporate, uh, corporate venture capital. And there's a guest or two I could think I could have on. If you want to suggest one, if you know a CVC, corporate venture capitalist at a big firm anywhere in the world, a big corporate, feel free to drop in the comments or go to dreamit.com slash live. Maybe we'll pick to interview them. A couple of people, a lot of people that we know. But if you're talking to a corporate venture capital team, you know, Comcast Ventures, Philips Ventures, Cisco Ventures, Intel Ventures, that type of thing, it's no problem to talk to them early on because you can get input, you can get uh, possible business relationships with them, grow it over time. So it's not too early to talk to them, it's fine. I just wouldn't get distracted. Here's gonna be another Dream It Live we're gonna do that I just want you to be careful of as an entrepreneur. Don't spend all of your time talking to investors. We see startups all the time, they just seem like all they're doing is raising all the time. And I wanna to say to them, if you spent half the amount of time trying to buy, get revenue and meet with customers instead of investors, that would be a better use of your time. How much time are you devoting to customers versus investors? Okay, let me take the next question. Again, if you have a question, please put it in the comment section. When you put your questions in the comment section, we'd love to know what company you're working with and we'd love to know what city you're tuned in from around the world. Please put it in. All right, so next question, let me just curse her down there. What are some strategies for finding data on comparables? And should these comparables be in the VC pitch deck? All right, so on comparables. So first of all, you could look at CB Insights. You could look at AngelList. You could look at Crunchbase. Probably Crunchbase and CB Insights are the two biggest that come to mind. If you're an MBA or you have an MBA in your team, a lot of business schools have a lot of databases you can get access to to get comparables. That's fine. If you have a friend that's a broker at Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, they often have comparables for publicly traded companies. So that's how you can get some, your hands on some of the comparable data. Data. Should you have it in your P VC pitch deck? Yeah, maybe in your appendix. I mean, what, what do you want on the comparable? If your comparable is what the valuation is, if your comparable is, and I saw one this morning, somebody gave me three comparables for all the exits that occurred. Again, this is a company that's about two and a half years old. They're two years in. They just raised a small seed round. They're thinking of doing a series in next week, and they're showing me the comparables for exit values. If you're showing comparables for exit values, put it in the appendix or don't have it there at all. Because again, you're telling me that you're focused on exit. If Jeff Bezos was showing comparables in his seed or series A pitch deck for Amazon, here's the comparables of what other, you know, what Barnes and Noble went public for or whatever, and now they're gone. It just, it shows me you're being myopic. Don't be myopic, build a world dominating, world beating company, monopolize early on. Okay, let's go to the next question. If you have questions, please put them in the comments and put your city name. All right, so next question. What are some ways to avoid overshooting valuation when fundraising and making an exit impossible because your valuation is too high? So how do you not overshoot on valuation fundraising and making an exit impossible? Okay, so let me tell you the secret decoder ring in the venture world um, of what happens for seed and series A. A lot of times, you don't really have that much control over valuation. You don't have a real EBITDA, you don't have numbers, EBITDA earnings before interest in taxes, depreciation and amortization. It's what, what's the net look like? I mean, you do have an EBITDA, just the number is very, very negative. So this isn't standard valuation. It's usually pretty mathematical. When you're a seed or a series A company, you're generally selling about 20% of your company when you're doing those early rounds. So it's reverse engineering on the math. If you're telling me you're raising a million bucks, what 20% of what is a million dollars? 25% of five million is about a million. So you have to deal with the pre and the post money valuation on that. So it's kind of reverse engineered as a pretty standard ratio. The one thing I want you to be careful of is I want you to think about from the venture investor's point of view, two things. Number one, the more money you raise at the higher valuation, the more optionality you take off the table. And that would be another great 
Dream It Live that we could talk about. Being careful about valuation, taking optionality off the table for both you and your investor. So if you raise a lot of money, let's say you raise $25 million, the number of companies that could acquire you for something that's gonna be interesting to you if you've raised 25 million in one particular round, let's say now you've raised 100 million, the number of companies that could acquire you has just drastically gone down by 80 or 90%. So there's less options on the table. As well, a venture investor is generally looking for a three to five time return on their money. Now you might be thinking that's exceedingly crazy, but if a venture investor isn't generating a three time return on their money when the money is out for seven years over a fund life, that generates about a 30% rough IRR, if you're not generating that kind of return, you're not doing well. So it sounds like it's really big, but it's over a very long period of time. That's what they're looking for. So now if they've put 20, let's say they put $25 million in, well, they need a three time return on their investment after capital is returned. So let's say you return $100 million to them. They take $25 million off the table. And now, oh, by the way, that's a three X return on your investment, but that's just one small portion. So anyway, the point is just be careful. We have a lot of companies that come into Dream It and we say, what's your success? What are you looking to do? I'm looking to raise 20 to $30 million. And our question is, why? Why that much? Winning as a startup is not raising the most money. Winning isn't getting the tech crunch headline that makes you feel good for all five minutes that you just raised the $30 million Series A. That's not winning. Being cash efficient, raising the amount of cash you do need. We'll do a separate episode on that. We have lots of startups that say, how do you figure out how much cash do you need? We'll talk about that. If you have other, again, if you have other suggestions for topics, throw it down in the comments or put it in slash live. We're happy to address those, but that's not winning. Winning is building a great company, dominating and figuring out what's right for you. By the way, on exit strategy, a friend of mine who lives in Atlanta, Garrett Vandergraaff had a, this is years ago, 15, 20 years ago, had a vending machine company, it had like 5,000 vending machines. And I said to Garrett, I said, it's awesome how many vending machines you have. What's your exit strategy around that? He's a good friend. This, we knew each other for years. What's your exit strategy? He's like, what are you kidding? It gushes cash. My exit strategy is called my will. <laughs> I'm giving this to my kids. Now, that's not what an adventure investor would want to hear, but it cracked me up. And it was probably the most funny answer on an exit strategy. All right, so let's see if we thoroughly answered that. What are some ways to avoid overshooting valuation? We got to that and make it impossible because your valuation is too high. Be careful. Winning is not raising the most money. All right, let's go to the next question. Again, if you have a question, please put it in the comments section. When you do, please list the city um, that you're dialed in from, or not dialed in from, streaming in from, we'd love to know. Let me take the next question. And then we have a couple more questions. We'll probably go for about another five or 10 minutes. Um, if you have your questions, please keep them coming. All right, so what's a good resource for establishing valuation? Is there a best valuation method from a Series A? And that was being asked by Paul Leake. Paul, thanks for asking the question again. Paul Leake asks, what's a good resource for establishing valuation? Is there a best valuation method for Series A? Again, Paul, it's really, and I'll just tell you something we tell all dream companies, it's really mathematical. It's a roughly a 20% ratio, plus or minus, but it's pretty close to that. Sometimes there's extremes where it's not 20%. I'd say 90% of deals. If you tell me how much you're raising, I'm gonna back into and tell you what your valuation is. So just a hint, Paul, and for others watching, when you're thinking about valuation, give a range, right? Because now you're, excuse me, when you're thinking about how much you're raising, give a range, because now you're implying valuation. So if a startup says, we're roughly going to raise somewhere between two and $3 million, well, 2 million is 20% of what number, which is different, you know, 2 million is 20% of $10 million from a valuation point of view. 3 million is 20% of 15 million. So we generally tell startups, Give a range, not too big a range, because you need a plan that works for both ranges, but it's reverse engineered at this stage. Later on, there's different metrics used. It's based on EBITDA, it's based on growth. A lot of it's on growth, Series B, Series C. There's different metrics. We operate largely in seed and Series A for original check, and then like any other investor firm, we do reserves for invest in startups we invest in to invest later on. But Paul, thanks for your question. Again, if other people have questions, please put them in the comment section. We have a time for a few more. Include uh, your name and what city you're dotted from, we'd love to know. Okay, next question is from jo uh, Jeff. Matus, Jeff, I hope I got uh, your uh, name mentioned correctly, but Jeff asks, if your pitch deck stopped on one slide, which one would you want it to be and why? Wow, that's a cool question. It's almost like I've had one slide. So if your pitch deck stopped on one slide, which one would you want it to be and why? Okay, Jeff, so I'm gonna do a shameless 
Dream It plug. Here's what I want to do for the answer. So first, go follow Dream It on YouTube and take a look at Dream It doses. And there is a Dream It dose there called a flashback, flashback pitch deck. So that's the slide I'd wanted to stop on. And I'm going to tell you what it is and then go watch the five minutes on flashback pitch deck. It's something that's pretty unique to Dream It that we also call Dream It companies that have traction to do. Your first slide in your deck would be your intro slide. What's your name, company name, contact info, make sure to have your contact info on that cover slide. And then the next question, the next slide is going to be your flashback pitch deck slide. And what it's going to be is a snapshot summary of the key metrics of your company. It has your company name. It has what problem you're going to, what you're solving in a really like one or two sentence. It talks about the solution and what's unique in one or two sentences. It talks about what traction you have, very tightly meaningful traction, your key KPIs, not vanity traction, real numbers. It's going to talk about what your go-to-market strategy is in just a sentence or two. It's going to talk about how much you're raising and it's going to talk about what those funds are going to be used for. And when you talk about what those funds are going to be used for, it's how you're going to grow. We're going to do, we can do a whole nother Dream It Live around all the mistakes people make around when they say how much they're raising and all the people they're going to hire. It's the wrong way to think about it. You raise money to achieve goals, mostly revenue goals. That's what we want to focus on. So if there's one slide, I'd want that computer to freeze up and lock on. It's that one page flashback pitch deck. Again, if you watch that episode, of the Dream It Dose called, I think it's called uh, Flashback Pitch Deck. If you watch that episode on YouTube, it'll give you the full answer. We also have a companion piece on Medium. We have a full blog post that describes that. And again, let me tell you why. In that one slide, in three minutes, you're going to hit all the key elements the investor cares about the most. The reason we suggest that and why we call it a flashback, just to go a little bit longer on that point, is it's a little bit longer you what when you watch a movie, and I think I talk about it in that Dream It Dose, you know my wife hates this movie format, but it's very effective. You know when a movie opens and in the first minute, it's like a flashback, they show to the end of the movie, like what ends, and then the movie goes back to the beginning and my wife's like, oh no, not a flashback movie. But it's very effective. At the end of the day, the investor wants to know what's your traction, what makes you unique, how much you're raising, what are you gonna do with it? So what you do is you come into your deck, you hit that flashback, you give them all the key elements and they say, now, let me tell you the story of how we're gonna get there. But you've hooked them, you've piqued their curiosity. Andrew Ackerman from Dream It has a great line. If I don't hear a startup talking about traction in the first three or four minutes of their pitch, I assume it's because they have not, because it's the number one thing an investor is interested in. So that's the slide I'd, I'd end it on, or what I'd get frozen on, where PowerPoint locks up on a Windows PC, but if you're using Google Slides on a Mac, you wouldn't have that problem. But anyway, it's a separate story. We have that problem too, but huge fan of Google Slides, and we're very Mac-based. Anyway, that's that question. Uh, Jeff, thanks for asking it. Let me just see if there's any other questions. I think we got all of them. Good resource for establishing valuation. We talked about that in valuation method. We hit Jeff's question. If your pitch deck stopped on one slide, we got it there. Um, I don't see any other questions from people. Really appreciate you joining us today. Let me just wrap up and hit on a couple of key points. If you like the show, please help us spread the word. Feel free to share this episode. It'll be right up on the Dream It uh, website. Excuse me, not on the website. It'll be gonna be on the LinkedIn page for Dream It Ventures. Really appreciate you if you share it, like it, comment on it. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please go to dreamit.com slash live or put it in the comments. People you'd like to see us interview, topics you'd like to see us hit, if you're a startup or know of a great startup that's early stage that focuses in secure tech, urban tech, health tech, go to dreamit.com slash apply or just feel free to DM me. We'd love to talk to you. We have room for a little bit more. We start in a few weeks. Right now, this recording is um, like September 22nd, I think is today's date. Oh, excuse me, August 22nd. Let me not jump the clock forward. Uh, so we'd love to hear if you have interesting startups, love to hear from them. If you have any other comments or questions, please let us know. Please follow us on all of your social channels. We really appreciate you tuning in. For those of you in North America today, we'd love to say enjoy the rest of your summer. For those of you in South America, in Australia, on the summer hemisphere, we hope your winter is going well and you'll visit us up here. I'm Steve Barsh, one of the managing partners from Dream Adventures in Philadelphia. Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks again to Charles for your help. Dream Adventures up in New York. Dustin for producing and directing today Dream Adventures in Philadelphia. Thanks for your time today and tuning in. Look forward to hearing from you.